today we are going to be talking about pattern hacking. Um, and for me, this is actually after fitting is my second favorite thing about sewing. So number one, fitting, right? But number two is pattern hacking. Um, because I really think that that's what really transforms, um, sewing for me, right? Like it suddenly means that you have so many more options. Um, also, it's just really fun. Um, Ayala, who's one of our Cash Merit team, is particularly obsessed with pattern hacking. And every time we do something, she's like, can I do pattern hacking? And I say, of course you can. Um, is it can be a little bit time consuming. I say, Ayala, why don't you do it? And I won't do it. Um, so all around, it's another reason it's good to have a team. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking you through um, a couple of different approaches and sort of thinking about pattern hacking and how it works. I'm going to show you a bit from um, my online class, Pattern Hacking for Curves. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed it works, but we're actually going to have a few of you guys sharing pattern hacks that you've done. Um, one of the fun things, actually, in, in putting this together was realizing how much stuff we've done on pattern hacking, more than I realized, actually, over the years. Um, so there's lots of inspiration for you. So I wanted to just start, you know, with what is pattern hacking? So really, it's changing a sewing pattern into something else. That's basically the, the definition of it. And there are lots of reasons why it's really awesome to do, but here are just a couple of them. So first of all, it lets you customize and personalize a pattern. Um, and what's better about sewing than that, right? So when you go into like a store, the number of times I've seen like a sweater and I've been like, oh, I like that, but I don't really like the depth of the neckline. And in the past, you know, that's it. Like, if you don't like the neckline, try and find another one. But with sewing, the amazing thing is you can hack that pattern and very easily give it the neckline that you want. So it lets you customize and personalize. You don't need to wear what everyone else is wearing, not even what other people are wearing in sewing patterns. The second thing it lets you do is get more mileage out of your pattern collection. So there are theoretically, right, like infinite pattern hacks you can do for any pattern. Um, but just to give you an example, um, the pictures you're going to see on these slides are all from my Pattern Hacking for Curves class. And we use the Springfield top and we turn it into 10 different garments. But honestly, it could be like 50 quite easily. So all of a sudden, you can take one thing that you have and have loads and loads and loads and loads of garments. You can easily make an entire wardrobe out of like three or four patterns. No problem. And the other one, and this is the one I think people don't tend to think about, but I actually think personally is one of the biggest benefits of learning to pattern hack is that you can co avoid constantly fitting new patterns. So what I mean by this is, let's just say, you know, you've made the Springfield top and you've made it fit you and you're great. And then this really cool one comes out and it's got a ruffle on it and it's from another brand. And you think, oh, fantastic. I love that ruffle. I'm going to go and buy that. Now you have to go back to step one and try and fit it. And especially if like you're an H cut bust, you're going to be having to do this like mega um, pattern adjustment on it. Right. And honestly speaking, it takes so much less time to hack a ruffle on the existing Springfield top than it does to go back to basics and have to start on a B cut pattern and trying to make it an H cut pattern. I mean, I have personally have like fallen, to this like issue in the past myself without even realizing it. So for instance, some of you may have seen at some point, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I went to an Oktoberfest. So I wanted to make myself a dirndl. So the first thing that I did was I went to Berda and had a look because Berda's famous for like having like 10,000 dirndl patterns. And so I got it and I'm like, I'm so excited. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to do an FBA on a princess seam of a B and take it to an H, which technically it's possible, but oh, it's like, it's a bit of a car crash. It's not a great idea. And it took me a few minutes. And then suddenly I was like, what am I even saying? I could adapt the Upton dress into a dirndl really easily. I converted it to princess seams from darts. And we actually have a blog post on how to do that. Um, and then I split it down the middle and I, and lo and behold, I had something that fit me the very first time that I tried it. There was no fitting required because I know the Upton dress already fits me. So that's what I mean. There's often opportunities to um, get the look that you're after, which is maybe a new pattern that came out, but from existing patterns that already fit you. And for me, that's like such a lifesaver when you're otherwise having to do like really quite complicated pattern adjustments. Before we go on, I wanted to say that just for people on this webinar, um, we're doing 20% off the online workshop. So basically, if you like what we're talking about today, 
you're going to like this workshop. I actually take you through step by step, like exactly how you both change the pattern and how you sew up 10 different patterns from the Springfield top. But also it doesn't just apply to the Springfield top. The principles I'm showing you could actually be used on almost any pattern. Um, so you can get 20% off using code hack at home until May the 10th, 2020. Um, and it also happens to include a 30% off coupon for any pattern. Um, right now, this very moment in time, we actually have our three for two sale on that runs until May the 11th, I think. Um, so if you do get that coupon, wait until after the sale to use it because you can't use two coupons at the same time. But well, basically, after you bought your lovely three patterns in the sale, you can go and get another 30% off another one the following week. So that's just a little offer that we have today. So this is, just if you're interested, um, the 10 things that I show you how to do in the class. And you can see how some of them are subtle differences and some of them are pretty big differences. So we've got the ruffle here. You can't really see very easily, but the middle one on the top, that's princess seams. I've got a button back a cap sleeve, collars, um, a sort of keyhole at the back. I make it into a dress, a tulip back, just tons and tons of different options for that top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through, first of all, some really easy things. So if you're thinking about pattern hacking or a beginner or you're new, these things are super easy and a great place to start. And then I'm gonna take you through some things that are a little bit more complicated. And then finally, I'm going to share with you resources that um, you can use beyond just our class to help you do pattern hacking. If you have questions, you can ask them in the chat box at the bottom. And occasionally I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask Carrie if there are any questions, happy to answer them. And also, hoping this is going to work, we're going to have two people hopefully sharing their hacks, Tanoa and Ashley. So we'll see if that works out logistically. Fingers crossed. So let's start off with some things that are easy. So the first one is quite funny because, you know, at this point, obviously I'm an experienced sewer, but I can tell you that at the very beginning when I learned to sew, I remember not using a pattern because I didn't like the hem length. Now, now I laugh at myself. I'm like, oh, ha, ha, that was so naive. But I tell you what, if you're a beginner, it's not necessarily that obvious, right? That you can change a hem length. And in fact, lengthening and shortening patterns is a way that in some cases you can radically alter a pattern, um, both in terms of like style, but in also your personal comfort. And it's actually not very difficult at all. So you can lengthen and shorten the whole body of something, just like a bottom hemline or sleeves. Um, now, obviously it depends on the type of sleeve a little bit. If you have a cap sleeve, you can't just extend that because it doesn't go under here. But see the sleeve that I have here that goes to my, that goes to my, um, elbow. This is the old cut dress. This could be anywhere. This could be here all the way down to here. I could go there if you wanted to, you know, anywhere. You could do it any length very easily. Now, one thing that helps is that cashmere patterns, we have lengthen and shorten lines on our pattern pieces. Um, as time's gone on, we've had them on more and more pieces. So if you have like an OG 2015 Appleton dress, um, it might not be in some places, but these days you'll see it on like, you know, almost all the pieces. Um, and basically that's what you use to help you uh, do the alteration. So the first example I wanted to give you here is the Appleton t-shirt made into the Appleton dress. So you can see me in full hair and makeup in a studio and then me standing outside. Um, so I'm gonna move my people over here. There we go, I'm in the middle of myself now. Um, so this is like a really basic hack, but this is something that Concord t-shirt dresses have actually been like super popular. People have loved it. Um, and if you, again, you made the Concord fit you already, super easy just to extend it. So for this, all you're gonna do is cut at the shorten and lengthen line and then push apart the pattern pieces, the distance that you want. The reason that you don't just add at the hem is that we're trying to keep the shaping. In the case of the Concord, honestly, it wouldn't make a huge difference, but in some patterns it actually will. So that's why you want to add at the length and shorten line and not just at the bottom. So you spread the pieces apart and then basically you join them up again. Now, when you spread them apart, especially if you spread them apart a lot, they may no longer be like perfectly lining up, right? They might be like this. So then what you have to do is just draw a new side seam and you just basically even it out. This is something where it's always a good idea to make a muslin, but I'd say if you're pattern hacking, you really want to do it um, because you do need to make sure, for instance, that you've given enough space to your hips. Um, if you think about the Concord t-shirt, like it finishes at sort of like the mid hip. 
Um, but depending on your shape, like for instance, if you get bigger below your mid hip, you might need to flare it out a little bit more. Um, if you don't, then you can just keep on pulling it down. I'm very straight, so it doesn't affect me. I can just pull it straight down. But if you're a little bit bigger, you may need to make it slightly angled out as you go down. So that's like, you know, the most basic kind of pattern hack, but already is something like, I wore that dress thing, tunic, incessantly, and also all through pregnancy. And in the end, it sort of fell apart. But I adored that. And it was such a basic hack of something that already fit me. Another example is our lovely Ayala here. So this is our Hollyoak maxi dress. So again, when we launched this, we got a surprising number of comments of people saying, but I don't like maxi dresses. So this is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like, it doesn't matter. If you like the style, you can simply shorten it, right? Like there is no such thing in a way as like a maxi dress pattern because any maxi dress pattern can be shorter if you just draw a line higher up. So in this case, um, there's two examples. One that's probably more intuitive and one that's less. So Ayala in the lemony one simply cut the pieces at knee length. So this wasn't um, about cutting at the length and shorten line and pushing them together. She literally just went up and cut at the length that she would want it. Um, and these are both blog posts as well. So if you Google Hollyoak hack, you can actually see the exact pattern pieces and what Ayala did. And then she also added patch pockets on the front. So another like super simple thing, right? Like it's just squares of fabric, um, but added and added to the dress and made it look a little bit different. And then something you might not have even thought of, but a dress can be a peplum top. So in this case, again, Ayala cut it even higher, the skirt pieces, and suddenly made it into a little top rather than a dress. Sometimes people ask us, well, how do I know how much fabric I need? And they sometimes like email us. So it's not the, it's something that you have to do. Like we don't have a like number that we can just give you because it depends on how long do you want the skirt? What size you are, what size fabric you're using. So it's not something that, you know, I can just go, oh, it's two. What you would ideally do is make your pattern pieces and then lay them out. And if you want, you can just lay them on the floor and then just measure how much you would need. If you do have Illustrator, it's a little bit faster, but I assume most of you are not using Adobe Illustrator for your sewing. Um, but that's what we would recommend that you do. Um, we don't have any easier way of doing that than you do, apart from we do it on a computer. Um, but depending, because it depends on the length and it depends on the size you're doing. But this, I think, just goes to show, like, if you really love, like, the bodice of something and you're like, I love that, but the skirt isn't the kind of skirt length that I would like, super easy to change it. So, Next up, I want to talk about changing the neckline. So this is another one that we get emails about like constantly, right? People are like, I love the Turner, but it's too low cut. Or I love the Rivermont, but it's too high. Or people will be like, I don't love V-necks. I would like to have a round neck. Or, you know, every combination we get of people talking about necklines, also sleeves, which I'll get to in a minute. So necklines in many patterns, if not most patterns, are very easy to change. There are some patterns where it's a little bit different. So for instance, the Hollyoke that I just showed you, that's not that easy to change because it goes across here and it has straps. So you can't really like, you can't really bring the neckline up because it's already at your armpits without it kind of, I don't even know how it would go, right? Because it's, because it's strapless, sorry, it's sleeveless. But on a sort of like regular pattern and most patterns, you can change the neckline really easily. So the example I wanna show you first is of the Turner dress. So here you can see on the left, the original, which is a V-neck, which I will say when you wear it, it pulls a little bit because of the knit. And so it, it ends up looking a bit more like this. It doesn't look like a sharp V like the Alcom. And I made it into a round neck. Very, very, very easy. So it's as simple as drawing. Okay, it seems like something I think again, if you're new, you might be like, oh, technical. It's really not in most patterns. So you literally draw on the new neckline that you want. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. Now there is um, sort of a, the thing that's a little bit harder is how am I going to finish the neckline there? So first of all, in the Turner, it's not a problem because it's a lined bodice. So anything where it's a lined bodice, it's great. Like you just sew the two pieces together and you're done. If it has a facing, 
you're going to then have to change the facing as well. So basically you take your new neckline that you've drawn and you draw around it and you make the facing. And usually you trim a little bit off the neckline edge of the facing so that when you sew it, the facing goes slightly to the inside. It rolls to the inside. If you're using a binding, if you're using a woven, you would just measure the neckline, the new neckline length and use that. Plus like give yourself another two inches or something. And if you're using knits, there are all kinds of different equations. It really honestly depends on like how stretchy your knit is, but a pretty good rule of thumb is you want it to be 80% the length. So let's say that you change the Concord neckline and you still want like a round neck, but let's say you want it deeper. You'd measure the neckline with a measuring tape. You'd multiply that 80% times 0.8 and that would be the length of the binding that you would want. So actually with necklines, it's actually not like the changing the neckline that's tricky. Sometimes it's changing the finishing of the neckline. So I want to show you a few illustrations. So when I say draw it on, I literally mean guys, draw it on. So the black is the original turn of front piece. So here we're like, what if we wanted like a tight but deep scoop? There we go. I continue drawing the shoulder and a deep scoop. What if I like the V, but I want a higher V? I just draw a higher V. What if I want a scoop neck, which is what I had before in the image? Draw that. So having a French curve, which is a curved ruler, um, that can really help. I use the Dritz styling design ruler a lot um, because you want to make sure that it's a curve. If you're trying to do a scoop neck, one important thing is where it hits the center front needs to be a right angle. If it's anything other than hitting the middle at a right angle, it will actually be a point, which might be okay, you might not mind, but you need to make sure if you want a true curve that it's coming out at a right angle first. Um, yeah, so smooth line, right angle in the middle. The other thing I would say is it's tricky to do asymmetric. So you can try and give it a go, but especially in a knit, there's some negative ease like pressure through the garment and it's even across your body. If you make it square, it's quite likely it's gonna sort of do this. Um, sorry, if you make it asymmetric, it's gonna like pull to one side more than it's intended to. You can give it a go, but usually it's a good idea with necklines to try and keep them symmetrical as much as you can. Square ones, actually, while I think about it, a square one in a knit can be a bit tricky. If you want to go square, you're going to want to stabilize the neckline first, like with um, interfacing. I'd say a, a, probably like a solid knit interfacing would work, and you're probably going to want to use a facing. It's a little bit trickier to work. In a woven, you know, you can go ahead and do it. Um, it's just a matter, again, of making a facing. So necklines are a good idea. Um, the third thing that I wanted to talk to you then about is adding button bands. So you can see in this picture here, this is the Springfield. And what I've done is I've added what is effectively decorative because I do not, you know, necessarily functionally do anything with access to my back. Although I guess if you needed access to your back, you know, great idea. Um, and you can add a button band to the front or the back of actually most things. Um, so for this one, I actually want to show you the video um, and I'm going to just show you not the sewing part, but the drafting part. So you get the idea. In some ways, adding a button back is really simple, but in another way, it can be a little bit more complicated. So let me push you over there. Here we go. So this is a little preview of pattern hacking for curves and showing you how to draft a button band. Is the music playing? Oh, hold on. Show you how to make the Springfield top into a button back top. So the principle I'm going to show you works equally well whether you want to put the button. Oh, sorry. There we go. So now I'm going to show you how to make the Springfield top into a button back top. So the principle I'm going to show you works equally well whether you want to put the buttons on the front or on the back. In this case, I decided to do it on the back below the yoke piece because I think that looks quite cute. So all we're going to need to hack is this one back piece and it's view A, which is the piece on the fold. 
So we're not going to cut it on the fold because we need to have the two pieces that come together and button. Um, but we do want to make sure that the back line where it would have been cut on the fold remains in the center back. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And as I show you this, I'm going to make the back button band one inch finished width. Um, and that's kind of like a nice proportion for this top. But if you want to do it a different width, you can, and I'll explain how. So the first step is we're going to trace the piece onto the tracing paper. And I'm going to use this industrial weight to put it down, also useful for self-defense. Um, and I'm going to use a Sharpie to trace the piece first. I'm using a Sharpie so that you can see what I'm doing. You would probably just use a pencil. So always better to use rulers when you can. Um, you're going to get a better line. And you can use the French curve to do the side seam. You know, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're going to need to move the French seam a little bit each time in order to follow the curve because you'd be very lucky if it fits perfectly. And you also want to remember to transfer your notches so that once you sew, everything is in the right place. So now we just have the traced back piece. So as I mentioned before, we want to have a one inch band um, and we're gonna do that by a folding method. So we need to add two inches to the edge. Why do we need to add that? So the button band needs to be half on the one side of the center back and half on the other side. That means it's half an inch on both sides. So first of all, I'm gonna mark half an inch in from the center back. going along with the half inch on my ruler here. And then I'm gonna do a half inch on the other side. You don't have to mark all these lines, but it's gonna be helpful for pressing later if you mark them onto your fabric. Okay, I'm gonna extend the top and the bottom a little bit so I make sure that they're parallel. Okay, so this is gonna be the width of our finished band. So then we need the back of the band because it folds over. So we need one more inch. So I'm going to add another inch on here. And then finally, we need the seam allowance, which is going to tuck under. This will all make sense when I start to demonstrate it. So the seam allowance is half an inch. So I'm going to add another half an inch. Okay, so what's going to happen is this will fold under, then the whole thing will fold under again, and we will have a button band. So the next step is to cut out your pattern piece. Okay, I am going to stop there because that was basically how you made the pattern piece. And after that, it was simply a case of uh, folding the pieces in and making a button band out of them. But you can see the kind of logic that I'm going through, right? Like I'm tracing a piece because you always want to trace first, marking the notches because you'll need them again. And then really just thinking about where do I want the things to be, right? Like where do I need the center back? How wide do I want the button band? And then just drawing it. But as you can see, it was super easy. I could have equally done that to the front um, and made it like a little, um, almost like a tiny button down shirt without a collar. Um, I, you really could do it anyway. You could make two. Um, but adding a button band is really something that like transforms the look of a garment and is really easy. So I want to answer a few of your questions before I continue going along. And Carrie, I had a look during the video, so I'm up to date. Okay, great. So a few people were asking about changing the width or the depth of the neckline. So really it's going back to the image that I showed you before and I'm gonna bring it up again so you can have a look. So you're literally just drawing it in, right? So for instance, this first one over here that we're looking at, this is narrowing the neckline, right? Because we, now this is different than narrowing the shoulders. If it's too far off here, you need to do a narrow shoulder adjustment. We're talking about the neckline, which is this part. So here, what you can see is I'm simply extending the shoulder towards the neck. 
And then I'm raising the point. So this, this hack also made it less low cut. It brought it up. So really, if you think about it, imagine there's a line on the shoulder going all the way up and there's a line on the front going all the way up. Now, if you did that, the shirt would end here, right? Which isn't going to work. However, you can really join those two things. You can join the shoulder and the front line anywhere you want. So if you wanted it to be like very, very high, you would really just draw the shoulder as far as almost as far as you can and then just a little bit for the neck and then straight down. So you should really never let, you know, the like low cutness of something be, you know, a deal breaker on a pattern because it's just so easy to change it. Now, caveat, there are occasionally things it's less easy to change it on. For instance, what I am wearing right now, right? So the issue with wrap overs is you can see it comes to here and it, and it comes from my neck here. So you could have this come further to my neck here and effectively give yourself like another I don't know what that would be, right? Like another inch of coverage. So you could do that. But if you wanted it here, we run into trouble because if the piece went across here, it would have to go in like above under my arm. Technically speaking, you could move this piece to your armpit and it could go like this. But there's only, so, if you think about it just from a geometry perspective, there's only so far that piece of fabric can go. Um, so with things that are wrap over, like you can, you can increase the coverage a bit. Generally, we recommend going up a cup size if you can. So if you're not already in the GH, go up to the GH because that will give you more coverage. But to give you the idea. Jenny, um, can, you, can you show that again now that you're not screen sharing? So oh yeah, can see sorry. It. So what I'm saying is you could move this to here and then you would get this, an extra strip of fabric effectively all the way down here. And so it would take it to like there, I guess. But what I was saying is, say you wanted it like this, you're not really going to be able to do that because to go across, it would have to hit in the arm side and that basically wouldn't work very well. So this one you can change, but I will say with the Appleton, we get asked this a lot. That one's very tricky um, because of the angles and the bands and the way that the Appleton goes together. You, it's very difficult. Like you cannot get like a non low cut at all Appleton. Um, it's always going to be somewhat plunging. You should be able to have one that covers your bra. I mean, I'm wearing like an immense bra right now. It's so big nursing bra and I'm covered up. But um, you know, there are some things where it's like, if you don't like a wrap style, don't use the Appleton dress, right? But you can raise this one a little bit and you can raise quite a lot of other ones as well. So let's see if there were any other questions. Um, someone's asking about a good metal French curve. I'll be honest, I actually prefer my plastic one. So I can't say I've looked into metal ones, um, but I think you should look at like Gold Star Tool and also Wowak. They're the two places that we get most of our notions from um, and they may well have one. Personally, I really like the plastic because you can see through it and I find that quite useful for me. Okay, cool. All right, gonna go on to the next thing. So, what do we have next? Always a surprise with someone with baby brain. I can't remember what I'm doing half the time. Okay, so slightly more advanced hacks as I like to call it. So this is where hopefully we're going to have our friends joining. So what I wanna talk about here is either dividing a pattern into pieces or mashing up different patterns. So we have two people hopefully sharing. Um, we have Tanoa who's mashed two patterns together and we have Ashley who's separated a pattern and added something a little bit more extra. So Carrie, see if you can bring Tanoa in for us. We'll see if this works. <laughs> Is it working? Hi. Oh, hey. Okay, I'm gonna step out for a second, okay? Yeah. Okay. So, awesome. I have the darkness top here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, a little bit louder, maybe, if you can. Okay. I have the darkness top here, and this is the shirt that I've made. I've made maybe about three of them, but I love the fit so much that I decided to make a dress out of it. So, I have my pattern pieces. This is the original pattern piece. And I decided I just wanted it short 
in the front, just across, and then longer in the back. So I just adjusted the front piece by adding about 12 inches to the side that I wanted to be longer and then ending the other portion a little bit lower than the original blouse. Um, and then the back piece, I just added the extra about 12 inches. That's so, awesome. I've never seen anyone do it with the hem like that, to know, but it looks so cool and it really works like design wise, I have to say. I think it's because the pattern fits so well in general that <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> yeah, do you do a lot of pattern hacking usually? I don't actually, this just seemed pretty similar. Or it's, pretty easy yeah um, and I've been meaning to get the pattern hacking uh, video or lessons that you guys have so I'm definitely gonna get them after this but yeah um, I don't do it very often because I think it's a little bit too complicated oh and another thing as I'm talking um, the original pattern has a neckband and I decided mm -hmm. that I didn't want the neckband because of the style of the dress yeah so um, what I did was if you can see on the inside I have um, power mesh probably. Mm -hmm. Um, that I just lined the dress with. I didn't line the arms, just the actual dress. Um, and that's how I finished the edge. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's such, a, it's such a good idea because you get a very clean finish when you put the lining on. And also I imagine that it gives you like a little bit more like holding in-ness to it yes. as well, right? Actually, yeah, if you can see my pattern piece, I usually cut off, I wear in the Dartmouth either the size 12 or the um, size 14. So I, traced off both sizes and I cut the uh, lining in the 12 and then I mm -hmm. cut the dress, the outside in the 14. Yeah, right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Many comments, flip it up. Everyone loves it. You oh, look great. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. We'll try and go over to Stacy now if we can. Carrie's doing the uh, behind the scenes work now. So, uh, oh. hello. hello, Ashley, sorry, I said Stacy. I apologize. No worries. <laughs> so I will stand up as well, it's a quick change. So I made an Upton skirt. Let's see if I can get this a little further back here. Or if you like tip your, if you're on a laptop, you can tip. Oh the yeah, uh, that's a good plan. <laughs> I think I, I did this yesterday to see if it would fit. Oh yeah, perfect, we see it now. There we go. There we go. So I made an Upton skirt um, using the one on the blog. And then obviously it's got a ruffle on the bottom. Um, awesome. How did you how did you figure out how to do the ruffle? So I took um, four inches off the bottom, mm -hmm. the pattern. And then I measured what I wanted for the ruffle. And basically the hem ended up getting eaten um, into all these smaller baby hems. Yeah. Because there's a baby hem here, one here, and one behind. Um, and then basically measured the length and doubled it to get a rough. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, because it's always sometimes it's a bit hard to figure out what ratio works, but that looks like it worked really well. Yeah, double seemed about right. Um, 1.5 was a little like, wah. I mean, it's a bit a skirt like let's ruffle it right yeah but um yeah and it's got i added pockets nice and seam pockets um and i extended it so it goes into the waistband so, oh cool yeah so um That's a nice one it st stops them flapping yeah it stops them flapping around so it's really comfortable and then awesome. what what type of fabric is it ashley this is a cotton poplin Okay, nice. From Telio, it's very easy to work with. So, Did you also convert it to being elastic back? Yeah, so it's yeah. got elastic in the very middle panel in the back here. Yeah. See that with the print, but... Um, and how did you do that? Did you go up a size or did you adjust it? Um, I did go up a size from my regular size, like it said in the blog, but then yeah. I actually added just three inches straight into that back panel. Okay. So I just like basically took the back panel and then split it like straight up and down and split it out three inches. Yeah. I didn't mind that it gave me a little bit more volume at the bottom either. Yeah. I didn't really yeah. 
bother me. Um, and then just uh, made just that one panel elastic. Yeah. So. You only need a little bit. Yeah, I only needed a little bit. Um, obviously, I'm pretty straight up and down, so it doesn't really, like, I don't have a giant hip curve. I think if you had more curve, you might want to do it to more panels. Yeah. But for me, three inches was good to just be able to be able to, like, get it on and off and have it be, like, really comfortable. Yeah. So, because I find I fluctuate a lot through here, so it gives mm -hmm. me some room. And it's very comfortable, and then it's got pockets, so I've been wearing it through quarantine, like, all the time. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Everyone loves your bananas skirt, and I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Thanks. All right. That was inspirational. I feel inspired. Um, I love both of those approaches. And as you can see, they just did like a couple of different things, right? And it radically changes the appearance. So I'm not actually the most creative person in the universe when it comes to like what I wear, honestly speaking. Um, but I think that uh, you can really start to see like what a transformation you can have. So I want to continue sharing some more, slightly more advanced pattern hacks. So one now that I'm going to share, and this is one that Ayelet worked on because Ayelet is queen of the pattern hacking, um, is to change a garment type. But I also want to show you, well, it's creating a color block design, but it's actually a little bit more exciting than that. It's actually creating what's sort of like a quilted, a patchwork look. So what Ayelet did is she turned the fuller cardigan that you can see over here into this lovely sweatshirt. So she did a couple of things. The first thing that she did is effectively get rid of that button band. So she did that by cutting it on the fold and then also just by accounting for the width of the button band. So you have to basically think like, okay, do I need to add or subtract a little bit to account for the button band so that it still fits? I seem to recall that the first time she actually forgot to do that and it still worked. So if you don't do it entirely correctly, it'll probably still work. Um, so she did that and then it also meant that she had to change the facing at the top because the facing is assuming that it's stopping in the middle and going down um, but in this case it isn't but that is really it that's all that she really had to do to change it from a cardigan into a sweater and if you were going the opposite way you would cut the piece down the middle separate it out and then create the facings so the reason, you know, Ayala was really into doing this is it's our only like raglan sleeve pattern right now and she wanted a raglan sweatshirt. So that's the kind of thing where if there's a feature you like of a pattern, you might be able to take that feature and turn the garment into something else, but keeping the feature that you really like. And then the second thing that she did is create this amazing fabric um, out of patchwork effectively to create the front. Now, you might look at that and go, Oh my goodness, that is so complicated, right? Like she had to figure out all these angles and then how it fit the side and how it fit the neckline. But no, that is not how she did it. There is a much easier way to do it. And it's this. What she did is she made her fabric first. So basically, Ayala made, you know, more or less a square of her patchwork. Um, and she did have to do like a lot of hand basting to get it this accurate. So highly skilled, but she basically just made a piece of fabric like this. And then she took the, the pattern piece, placed it on top and cut around it. So she was not doing super complicated, tiny pattern pieces at all. She made the fabric and then she did it. I will say there's another thing that you can do if you're trying to do like stripes and a chevron on something, you can do the same thing. You can sew two pieces of fabric together first, get the chevron stripes going where you want and then place the pattern piece on top of that and cut around. Um, so this approach is like a really cool one when you're pattern hacking. And as you can see, it got this like super cool, unusual, um, very accurate looking fuller, uh, sweater. So then the next thing I want to go discuss is the um, famous sleeves, which we are always, always being asked about. So here is the, uh, the sort of short version of this. So the first thing is you can put a cap sleeve on most things. So what is a cap sleeve? A cap sleeve just goes over the top of your arm and it doesn't go all the way around the arm side. It is sewn into the arm side, usually until about here. And then the bottom is just open. You can do that because really you're just, you know, extending the shoulder. So you can put a cap sleeve in anything. Now, then what people want to know is, can I add sleeves to things? Can I take sleeves off things? So, the answer is, of course you can, 
right? Like anything is possible. It's just a little bit difficult. And some patterns do not lend themselves to it at all. Like you can try, but it won't be great. Now, the reason is all about this arm sigh. So counterintuitively, this, this um, dress I'm wearing, if you took the sleeve out, it would have a gaping arm sigh. The arm sigh would be too low and you would see my bra. And here it would be all baggy. The reason is that's the way arm sighs have to be drafted to have a sleeve in them and be able to move your arm. So basically the arm sigh is quite big. In a sleeveless garment, the arm sigh is not big, it is smaller. It is higher up here and it's further in here. So what that means is if you just took this sleeve out, this arm sigh would be a mess, right? It would be gaping and you would see my bra. And also the sleeve, the shoulder would seem too far out. The flip side is if you have a sleeveless garment and you just shove a sleeve straight on there, you won't be able to move your arms, okay? You'll be like, eh, 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 eh. So technically you can put it on, but it won't work. So if you're gonna do that, you have to change the arm sigh. There is no precise, like easy way that I can say, just do this. You can play with it though. So if you're very determined to put sleeves on something or take sleeves off something, the rule of thumb is, if you're going sleeveless, you need to make the arm size smaller. So you need to raise it up here and you need to um, make it smaller through here. And the flip side is, if you want to put a sleeve on something, you need to make the arm size a bit bigger. There is no formula that I can give you that is precise because it depends on what you're starting with and where you're going to. There are some patterns where we, as cashmere, don't recommend it, though I'm not saying you can't do it. So for instance, the upton, famously, right? People ask us all the time, can I put sleeves on the upton? So we have a sleeve expansion pack, but the types of sleeves we have are the only types of sleeves that work that we would recommend. So we have a cap sleeve, that works. We have a tie sleeve, which if you think about it, it isn't very constraining around your arm. So that's kind of why it works. And then we have the flutter sleeve, which is really big. So any sleeve that's very loose or small can work. But when people say, I want a narrow woven long sleeve, if you just put that on to the upturned bodice, you won't be able to move. It will feel like you're in a straight jacket. And that's why we don't recommend it. I have seen some people do it. I've seen someone, I think, try and put the Montrose sleeves on. It's a thing like, does it work? Like technically, will there be sleeves on that dress? Yes, there will be. Do I, as Jenny from Cashmere, think it looks good enough and is a good enough fit that I recommend it? No. Like, I don't want to put my name on it, if you see what I mean. But if you want to give it a go, you can. Um, obviously, you know, we're aware that there's a section of the population who only ever wear sleeves. And there's a section of the population who never wear sleeves. And um, it is not too strong a statement to say we have had literal hate mail about this. Like, literally hate mail about the question of sleeves on more than one occasion. In fact, many occasions. Um, so what we try and do is we have different, we have different ones right? So we have like ones that have sleeves, ones that don't have sleeves. And actually you can also um, search on our website now, there's a filter that you can click just sleeves or sleeveless. Um, and over time, you know, we're like adding to both because believe it or not, like all the people who want sleeves believe it's impossible anyone wants sleeveless and vice versa. So there's two very, very strong opinion camps. So we try and meet everyone's needs. But that's to try and give you the idea. Now, sometimes people ask us, can I take like the Lennox sleeve expansion or the Upton sleeve expansion and use them on other things? Short version is the cap sleeve, yes, right? You can put the cap sleeve on almost anything that you want. The other ones, no. They're not designed for other arm size. Um, we did have a question the other day about the Webster. The Webster has a very open uh, arm size you know, because it's this really summery thing and at the back it's cut out quite a lot, more than most of our patterns. So you could put a cap sleeve on that, but I really wouldn't recommend anything else. Um, but again, you know, like this is me saying I wouldn't recommend it simply because like, I don't think it looks that great and it won't fit that great. But you can do whatever you want, guys. Like whatever you make, if it works, it works. Who cares? I won't call the police on you. I might call the fashion police on you. No, fine. Um, so that is, the 411 when it comes to sleeves. So before we get on to information and resources, I'm gonna see if anyone has more questions. Okay, 
Someone asked, would it work to extend the cap sleeve of the Springfield to make a bigger flutterish sleeve? So the thing about the cap sleeve, right, is it doesn't come all the way around. So if you extended it, it would be like, a, it would almost look like a cape, right? It would come down and sort of like float around, but you wouldn't have anything under here. You could, <laughs> you could do it. Um, it would work-ish probably. Um, it depends on what kind of, you know, look you're going for. Um, and I would say like, you know, I, I put it deliberately under the like more um, advanced techniques. Like theoretically, if you're really into pattern drafting, you can figure out how to put a sleeve on anything. Um, but I would say that like looser sleeves or for instance, you know, the sleeves now that are cut down the middle and kind of come open, they can work because you can lift your arms up really easily. And so you're not going to be constrained. The biggest issue with putting sleeves on sleeveless things is you're going to be constrained and you're not going to be able to lift your arms up. That's the main issue, which for most people is a huge issue, right? Um, but I don't know, maybe you're just going for super fashion. You go to the Met Ball and you're just going to go around like this and you don't care. I don't care. Totally fine with me. Um, so does anyone else have any other questions? Um, I did want to mention on pockets. Pockets is like an easy one and one that also like there are so many options, right? So if you want to just put a really simple inseam pocket, like we have on like um, the holly oak, it's really easy. And in fact, or the Upton, you can just take the Upton, the Upton um, pocket piece and put it in anything. Um, you basically just put it in the side seams and sew around them and flip them back in. Now, it's not the most sophisticated kind of pocket. And actually, what Ashley showed you is having them catch in the waistband um, stops them flapping so much. And that's actually how the colder pants are constructed. Um, so you can do that. You can put patch pockets on really easily. Um, doing something like putting in like the diagonal pockets, that's a little bit more complicated, but you could. Um, and obviously, one thing is, you know, when you try different patterns, there are different techniques in them, right? And different... Um, uh, like methods. So if you really like the method of a pocket on this pattern, sometimes you can take those pieces and transfer them onto something else. Um, again, a little bit more advanced, but you can do it. Um, okay, so someone asked about adding a zip to the colder pants. So that isn't something I've actually done, although it's totally possible. Basically, you would just insert it as an invisible zip. So you would make the front and the back of the pants. Oh, actually, that's a good point, actually. Sorry. Hold on. That is how we do it, isn't it, Carrie? It's full front, full back, and then you put them together. Yeah, it's not one leg inside the other. Yeah, that's right. So you would make the full front pants, you make the back pants, and then you put them together. You know, you put an invisible zip in them first on one side, and then you would do the other side, if that makes sense. Sorry, the re I was having to think because some pants, you make a whole leg, you make another leg and you put one inside the other. So that would be different. But with the colders, you don't, you make a front and a back and put them together. So actually easy. You make the front panel, the front, sorry, you make the front legs, the back legs, you would insert the zip like this, fold them, sew the other side. Actually quite easy. Someone asked about collars. So um, collars are pretty easy. It's another one where really you're talking just about drawing right so you would need to think about what the neckline is that your collar is going into so you would need to be able to trace that and then to be honest like the world's your oyster really right you would just draw the shape of the collar that you want um you'd cut almost all of them you cut two and then you sew them together right sides together and flip them inside out um, but if you, you know, want to do a Peter Pan collar or so on, um, we actually at the moment, I should have mentioned this already, but we're doing the great Concord hack off um, on social media at the moment where we had a bracket of lots and lots of different possible hacks of the Concord and putting a collar on was one of them. Um, and it's actually in the class, um, the pattern hacking for curves class. I show you how I did it. But really, you would just think, you know, I would say with collars, one of the things you can do is make one out of paper first and see if you like it, right? Because it's so small. So I would basically like, if you're trying to figure it out, I'd be like, do I want like a Peter Pan collar? Do I want it pointy? You know, what do I want? I would make it out of paper and I put it on myself and be like, now I'm assuming here that you don't want a collar with a stand. If you do want one of them with a stand, it's going to be slightly more complicated. So by stand, I mean, in a 
traditional shirt, it sticks up and then the collar goes down, right? So it's holding it up. So for that, you could copy a collar stand from something else. So let's say you like the Harrison shirt, but you wanted like a massive 70s collar. You could keep the collar stand. And then instead of the collar being here, you could be like, woohoo. Um, but really, I would just play around with it. Um, you know, going on like Pinterest is fun to like see all the different you know, variations of things there could be. So, you know, maybe there's some like cool shape of a collar that you're interested in. Um, I know at one point there was kind of a trend for collars that had like layers on them, you know, there were like three layers of points at the end. That's kind of fun. Um, but that's exactly the kind of thing that can make something look radically different. Um, just think about interfacing. Usually with collars, you want to put some interfacing in because you want them to be a little bit rigid. Um, and especially if you're going to do something in a knit, knit collars can be a little bit sketchy. Um, so if you are going to do it, I would definitely interface it. Um, if you are doing that though, you need to make sure you can still get it over your head and that the garment isn't relying on the neckline stretching to get it off. Um, Patty is saying, interested in a slit sleeve on the Concord or Pembroke. So yeah, so basically for that, you would simply cut down the, cut down the sleeve, right? So you would take the sleeve piece, you would cut it in the middle, separate it, you would add seam allowance, cut them separately. You'd finish the seam allowance first, overlap them and sew it in as if it was one sleeve. And then you would have a split sleeve. Um, I think one thing that's cool about pattern hacking, when I first started running Cashmere, I know it sounds stupid, but like it was almost a surprise when the pattern drafter would send me things without instructions, right? Cause I was like, but like, where's the book that tells me how to make the thing? And um, initially it was quite a shock because I was like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure I feel confident enough. But you actually start to realize quite quickly that um, you know more than you think you do. Um, and at the very least, you can look at other patterns, right, that have a similar type of garment and look at how they construct them. So that's a really good one with pattern hacking. You might think like, oh, I have no idea how that's done. But if you sit back and think about it, you often can figure it out unless you're an absolute beginner. If you've never sewn a sleeve before, sure, you're not going to figure it out. But if you're not, you might be able to. Um, Jilly asked if you can do the Harrison without a collar. Yep. Yep. You can certainly take collars off things. So, um, we, oh, I guess we don't have it in the Harrison. So in the Lennox, we have the option, um, to like leave off the collar, but keep the collar stand, which looks like, um, I don't know if they, it used to be called a Mandarin collar. I don't know if it's still called that or not, but like a little collar that just like stands up. So you can do that on the Harrison by taking just the outer collar off. You can theoretically take the whole thing off and then you just think, need to think about how to finish the neckline. The most obvious thing to do would be um, to bind it or to do a little facing, um, which would be very easy. So again, for a facing, you just take the neckline and then you draw around it so that it's the shape of the neckline plus you know, an inch or an inch and a half, and then you sew it on. Facings are actually a really good option when you're just not sure how something could be finished or if you don't want any visible stitching on the outside. The biggest issue people have with facings is they can flip out, right? So like when you're wearing them, they suddenly like appear. Um, and that's not only in sewing ones actually, because uh, uh, my old Diane von Furstenberg wrap dresses used to do that all the time. I spent the whole time going, flipping my facing. So there's a couple of ways you can stop facings from flipping. Um, one is you can like take tiny hand stitches and do them down. I don't tend to do that. A second one is you can anchor them whenever there's a seam. So for instance, if there's a facing that went around here, I would stitch in the ditch, which means sewing on top of the seam in like the little valley where the seam is. Actually, I saw on making the cut the other day that in German it's called like stitch in the shadow of the valley, something like that, which I thought was kind of cool. The shadow of the valley sounds more exciting than the ditch, right? Um, so you would, you would like stitch along here and you're keeping the facing down. Another option is to take the facing. Let's just imagine I had a facing here. You take the facing and it goes like this into the arm side. So instead of going up here, it goes like this. And then it's sewn all the way in here and here. That really stops it flipping out. Like a facing cannot flip out like that. On our Webster dress, the facing, because we have a sleeveless, it goes like this and down. So that one also never flips out. So that's the only thing that I would consider um, doing 
if I was uh, not putting a collar on the Harrison. Ray told us it's a collar, granddad collar with just the collar stand. There you go. Mandarin meets in the middle, but doesn't overlap. There we go. Seam shadow. Oh, there we go. I got it like more or less right <laughs> in the shadow. It makes sense, right? Um, let me see. There was one question earlier about the green and white dress, I think probably from the slideshow, the Springfield dress that you're wearing. Hold on. Do we mean this one, the pineapple one? I believe so. Okay, yeah. So that's one of the, um, uh, I'm losing my words. That's one of the projects in the video. Oh my goodness, my brain. Yeah. In the workshop. I have too many, I have too <laughs> many like, baby things and house things going on right now. It's in the video workshop. So in that one, I show you how to slash and spread. So that's another really common um, pattern hacking approach, which is really, really great. So basically, if you want to add more volume to something, let's say you have a piece like this. You might think, well, I want it to be bigger, so I just do this. But actually what happens is you just end up with extra fabric at the sides, at your hips, but not in the front, and you want it evenly. So what you do is you draw lines along the skirt like this, you cut them, and then you spread the whole thing out. So imagine this is the pattern piece, and I, my fingers, I, I've cut these lines, and then you do this. And all of a sudden you have this new curve at the bottom and it's swishy and you've added fabric basically in lots of little chunks and it gives you the spread that you want. So when I make that dress in the online workshop, I'm slashing and spreading it to give it some swoosh. Because if you just took the Springfield and extended it down, you would end up with this like tight woven wiggle dress, which I certainly wouldn't want to wear. Maybe you would, that's cool, but wouldn't be for me. Okay, so I want to close up by sharing some info and further resources for pattern hacking. So there's a hashtag called you can hack it on Instagram, which is a really cool one to look at. And even if you don't have an Instagram account, you can actually go to it on a computer, just go to Instagram.com and type in the hashtag. And then you'll see lots and lots and lots of things that people have done. We have our workshop. Um, on our blog, we actually also have tons of pattern hacking. Um, and recently, um, I has actually gathered them all together as well. Now I'm trying to remember the URL. Is it cashmeret.com forward slash hack or hacks? I is checking and she'll let you know. Um, so we have a URL for that. Um, so we have, for instance, like the cedar top. Um, we have a bunch of different things on there and the Tobin sweater and coming up the Concord and we have the Hollyoke. So lots of different things that you can look at. Um, it's cashmeret.com forward slash hacks. Um, and then Seamwork also has um, a popular series. They do tons and tons of hacks actually. And the great thing about this is that you can apply the principles to anything, right? So you don't, it's, they're not saying like, you can make this pattern into this. It's like, this is a technique you can use to transform lots of different patterns. So almost every month, I think actually, they have hacks of whatever they've come out with. So it's really, really great for inspiration. Um, and again, it's a fantastic way to like get loads and loads more mileage out of what you have. So I hope you had a good time packed as usual. I want to say a huge thank you, thank you to Ashley and to Noah for showing their hacks, which is super cool. Um, and like I said, you can get 20% off the workshop using Hack at Home until May the 10th at midnight. Um, and yeah, and it's basically me doing this um, and showing you all the different techniques, lots and lots of like chat from me, as you can imagine, because that's how I run these things. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we don't have a webinar next week, um, but we'll be coming back to you the following week with a webinar all about fabric hosted by our very own Karen McGowan, in-house fabric expert at Cash Barrette. So I look forward to sitting back with a cup of tea and asking really difficult questions um, and seeing what I can do to throw Carrie off because, you know, that's the kind of lovely manager I am. Anyway, I hope yeah, you guys are having a good Thursday. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, and yeah, thanks very much. Bye, guys.